as well. I don't think color, yeah. color has got anything to do with performance. Rolling is part of separate part of the genes. Color is another part of the genes. Okay, in a week, how many times do you fly your birds? And how do you train your birds? Um, pigeons that are still developing. Yes. I like flying often as possible, every day if possible. Oh, got it. That are still developing. Once the pigeon is developed and it's solid in the row, then I will probably slow down. I will fly the pigeon... Uh, Maybe three times, maybe two times. I will look at what's happening in the air. Oh. Um, some breeds, if they are flown every day, they go out of the road. Then oh. they tend to just fly and not roll. Some oh. pigeons, if you keep them in for, them. for two, three days and you let them out, then they all roll down. Oh. So you need to find out what your kit does oh, yes. under those circumstances. God. My personal pigeons, now at this moment, uh, after the competitions, my birds that are all only fly on Saturdays. Oh, got it. If the weather is really nice on a Wednesday morning, yes. I will put them up so that they can stretch their wings a bit. But otherwise, only a Saturday, I let them in. And now with the mold coming, yes. if he only wants to fly 10 minutes, it's fine, he can come down. If something is bothering him, he's got a black feather or whatever can come. There's no pressure now. There's these birds that I'm going to put in the air soon. As soon as they go up, they'll be flying every day. Every morning, the weather is good. It's not, I'm not worried about wind. It's not raining. These birds will be up every morning. Okay, just to expand on what you just said now. Uh, you said when they're in the mold, would you, would you advise someone to fly birds that are molting? Like... Yeah, you need to you need to use your discretion. You know, um, okay. when I'm saying malt, yes, uh, there's a couple of different aspects of the malt. Yes, you get the body malt, okay, and then you get tail and flights, tail and wing flights malt. Oh, good. now you will find that a bird that molts in the wings, if it only throws one feather at a time, yes. There's no problem of letting that bird out so that it stretches its wings and it flies and it does one or two rolls or three rolls and it comes and sits. No oh, pressure in that. If you have a bird that throws more than one flight, which does happen, yes. now there's a gap in the gap in the wing or there's blood flights. Oh, yes. Flying that bird is a risk. So that bird will soon show you, once it's up in the air, that it doesn't want to fly because it's hurting. No. So that bird must be left. You can't expect a bird with pain to stay up in the air. Okay, that's on the wings. Yes. Tails is not such a serious problem. You know, two or three feathers out of the tail, the pigeon can still fly fine. The wings keeps it up in the air and the tail steers it. Understand? Exactly, it was about okay. to say. Yeah. The body mold. Yes. The body mold's a different story. Oh, if the pigeon goes through the body mold, you can see... Uh, the ears of the pigeon is covered with feathers. If those feathers are busy molting and you can physically with the eye see the ears, that pigeon is not comfortable in the air because he's got no protection. The wind, the wind will bother him. If it's cold, it will bother him. The pigeon will not tend to uh, be too resilient to fly. Okay, so that pigeon will possibly go up three or four or five minutes, come down because it hurts. It's oh, like yeah. constant wind in the ears. Then the body mold, the chest. Yes. If there is, if that feathering is not soft and smooth, yes. and it's rough, you've got some blood feathers here, what happens? There is no aerodynamics. The aerodynamics of the pigeon is bothered because it's not smooth. Oh, okay. Now, if you look at that with the blood pains and stuff, 
That pigeon, the, the, the feathers can't be pulled tight against the body. So there's, he doesn't have control over that. So that will also bother him. Now, flying and staying in the air with, while in body mold is much more effort for the bird. Much more effort. So that bird will also come down sooner. And he might be gasping for air. And then the guy say, oh, he came down because he's got a breathing problem. I must now treat all these pigeons for breathing. In the meantime, it's got nothing to do with the breathing problem. It's because that bird really struggled to stay up in the air. He overexerted himself. Okay, so you must, you must think of those. I have guys that told me, they say, Tommy, what can I give pigeons for breathing? I say, why? He says, my pigeons fly and they come down and their mouths are open. I say, okay, so when did this happen? He says, no, I flew them this afternoon, four o'clock. I said, yes, so, so what was the... Um, uh, what was the weather like? No, it was like uh, there was no wind. No wind. It was lovely weather, man. No wind. I said, yes, but it was 34 degrees. <laughs> 34 degrees. And it's now December. Some of your pigeons are in the malt. So I say, what you do is, eh, to prove that the pigeons might not be sick, what you do is, take your tackies, only put one on, and put on uh, 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 a jean and a long jacket and go run around the block three times and if you're not gasping for air then your pigeons might have a breathing problem <laughs> you understand <laughs> so right. you, you need to look at what's happening oh. don't just assume oh. so molting is very important so yes you can let the pigeons out but don't expect that's the time that you don't expect anything of the body. So we shouldn't be flown if it's molting if, body in the body. Yeah, you can let it, if it flies at, at, at its own leisure oh. and it comes down and you leave it, let it sit, you don't chase it. Then there's most no, you're not pressuring the bird. Got it. You're okay, you leave it up to the pigeon. Got it's it. easy as that. That's what I say, you know, uh, uh, I get some guys, they stand there with a flag and a fishing rod and a black bag on the fishing rod and they keep on chasing and then they say it's rubbish pigeons because they go sit on another roof. It's not the pigeon. The pigeon just can't stay in the air anymore. You, know, hmm. you, you, you need to think. Uh, okay, when you're pairing your beds, do you give them any medication or special food for them to produce you good babies? Um, I can give some hints to to guys that I have done in the past and which really helps. If you deem it necessary and feel uncomfortable about your pigeon's health before breeding, then yes, it's not a bad idea of treating them and cleaning them up a bit. Um, there is some readily available medications uh, on the market. Uh, I can show them one of them. It's called Fierazol Plus 5. It's a Dova product. It's not a very harsh treatment. It suppresses uh, salmonella, oh. uh, which turns into parathyroid later uh, if it becomes severe. Uh, e. coli, coccidiosis, and canker in pigeons. Oh. Substances in this uh, product is uh, furosolidone and dimetronidazole. Now, dimetronidazole is exactly the same substance that you get in mTOR. Oh. So when you treat your birds before breeding with this product, yes. I recommend that you first pair your birds, if they are in general health condition, pair the birds. Normally eight days later after mating, the pigeons will start laying eggs. After they lay the eggs, yes. only after they lay the eggs, then you treat with this product. Treat with this product for three to five days. Okay? The reason why I'm saying that is dimetronazole, which is the substance in this, I have found, personally, I have found that it influences the fertility. Oh. It's not permanent, but temporarily it influences the fertility of the birds. That's why I say let them first lay the eggs, then treat. So you make sure that when the babies hatch, that the pigeons' crops are nice and clean, and the pigeons' health has been boosted. Okay, this is the one product. While you give this product, 
of first handle the next product. Okay. If you can't get your hands on the Firazol Plus 5, you can use Aviomed 4 in 1. I can take it closer, the guys can look at it. Avio 4 in 1. Oh, God. You can. Um, oh, got it. It's got basically the same substance, same working effect as the Firazol Plus 5. Only difference is the canker medication in this product is Ronadazol. Ronadazol is a much lighter product. Okay, um, and I haven't had any side effects on fertility with Ronadazol. So, this you can use uh, either in tablet form or in powder form. So, either give each bird a tablet for three days, consecutive days, if you feel like it. I normally do any treatment that I do is five days. Um, and then you can do this even before they lay the eggs or after they lay the eggs. That is your choice. This, this product I deem to be a little bit safer in my personal opinion. Now, while giving these products, there's a very nice product also from Aviomune. It's called Intromune uh, from Aviomed. And uh, this product a, acts as a probiotic. Probiotic and it suppresses uh, parathyroid and uh, E. coli uh, boosts the natural immune system of the pigeon because of the friendly bacteria that's involved in here. So a very good general health booster, if I may call it a booster, to oh. give your birds. Yes. This can be administered by with the food by just wetting the food a bit or with a bit of oil of your preference, okay? So, basically, if the pigeons were in general health, that's what we can do. If your pigeons are sick, or they tend to be sick during uh, your mating period, then you need to take a bit more drastic measures, okay? You can uh, then divert to some Stronger antibiotics, uh, stronger product ranges. Uh, for instance, uh, nothing wrong with giving the pigeons YBD, the YBD mix. Uh, one day we can talk a bit more about young bird disease, but at this moment I call the product YBD mix. Now, YBD mix suppresses a lot of pigeon issues. Uh, Canker, E. coli, coccidiosis, salmonella, which turns to parathyroid at a later stage. Um, even this uh, will help with breeding, mycoplasma, etc. So that's a very broad spectrum. If your pigeons look ill and you want to start breeding, then take a bit of a stronger measure and give a stronger medication. Yeah, that's basically the advice I can give on uh, medicating birds. Now, feeding, feeding of the birds. Special feeding. Special feeding is a different story. Uh, depends on what breed you breed. For instance, racing pigeons are large, large pigeons. They can eat uh, large mice and they can feed it to the babies because the babies are also large. Me, uh, I'm breeding rollings, uh, small breeds, German owls, Fringi owls, Komodo tumblers, breeds like that. Uh, they can only swallow the big mice. Okay. So when I breed, I tend to make the mix finer. Smaller seeds, uh, more peas, as more protein. I uh, give nothing larger than a popcorn mice, just a little bit of popcorn mice in between. And then, of course, I also use laying pellets. Laying pellets, I try and find the smallest size pellet that I can. At this more moment, uh, meadow and um, I think Super Performance supplies a nice pellet, which is swallowable for the smaller breed birds. And then, of course, adds the calcium needed, some more protein for the growth and the development of your babies. So that's what I do for feeding. Okay. According to you, when is breeding season in South Africa? 
you shouldn't have asked me that question. <laughs> uh, <laughs> somebody must tell me because breeding ten breeds, I don't have a breeding season. Okay. Uh, I, I breed right through the year. Um, when I feel like mating up a pair of a certain breed, I pair them up and I breed. But yes, I won't breed with a bird that is heavily in the malt. Oh. Let, let, let's put it that way. Oh. Um, if the bird is heavily in the malt, it puts additional stress on it to breed, etc. So yeah, I won't recommend that. Um, some guys say winter babies are stronger. Yes, I uh, agree. I definitely agree. Uh, I wish they would sometimes abbreviate on that why they say it's stronger. Elaborate more. Elaborate more, yes. Um, I can abbreviate on that a bit. And the reason being why winter babies seem stronger yes. is that it's also in South Africa, it's the dry season. Oh, good. Dry season means the population of the growth of bacteria in everybody's loft is way less than in the wet season. So chances of adult birds or breeding stock or the babies getting overly infected with bacteria is much less than in summer. So if you decide that you don't want to take the risk of breeding in winter because a baby gets scooped out of the nest, an hour later it's dead because of the cold. So that's a risk that you face breeding in winter. Um, if you think that you don't want to take that risk, you'll rather breed in summertime. Summer breeding, now winter breeding season is anything starting from March, April till about end of August. Uh, September the heat comes, October the rain comes, so that's already summer breeding. Uh, as soon as you start getting rain as an implement, it looks like summer breeding. Then you have to be, in the summer breeding time, you have to be much more wake up and don't get caught with your pants down. Uh, even if your lofts don't get wet when it rains, yes. the actual moist, the physical moist the humidity that increases in the air causes dampness in anybody's lofts. And you just need a little bit of damp on droppings and around the nest or droppings on the floors or droppings in the food troughs that might be there uh, to cause a bacteria growth. Okay, so yes, uh, personal preference to every breeder. Um, but there are pros and cons. Mm -hmm. To me, I don't care. I breed pigeons. And as you can see, my birds, they breed everywhere. On the ground, on nests, wherever they happen, they can breed. Oh, got it. Okay. I've heard people say that you shouldn't breed red to red because uh, they tend to get birds that will come too long on you. They roll down in most cases. Red to red, they say, are dangerous birds. What's your take on that? After Bang, I really can't comment on that. Uh, as I said previously, the other question yes. about color preferences oh. is that um, I think it's personal experiences people had. Oh. Uh, and it's possibly linked to the breed they are breeding or the line they are breeding or the family they are breeding. 100%. Uh, they got certain genes in their stock loft. And yes, on those specific genes, when they make red to red, the pigeons roll down. They make black to red, they fine, or black to red, they fine. So that's possibly a personal experience that they have or had, but I will not draw a line and say that's that's a fact with every roller pen that you bear. I, I honestly can't see because I bred reds to reds many times in my life. And Okay, to expand on that, uh, what is recessive red according to you? Recessive red bed, what is a recessive bed according yeah. to you? Any, any bird that's called recessive, uh, whether it's a recessive red, a recessive yellow bird, you will see that the, the actual red color is more intense. Yes. And it, proves to show no pattern 
So you won't see bar or you won't see check pattern. Oh, God. So it's a full spread of the color, an even smooth spread of the color. I'm not a genetic expert, yes. but to me, a recessive colored bird is a spread of the color showing no pattern. Um, you get recessive in black, red, yellow, uh, even in white. Oh. White, pure white birds can also be recessive white birds, where sometimes a white bird appears white but is actually a black bird. Oh. Because it's just because of the pigmentation of the feather, that bird can actually be a black bird, assuming to be white. But when you breed with it, out pops black birds. Okay, so it takes also time when you want to breed pure whites. And I had that when I bred white racing pigeons. Yes. Is that you got a lot of 25 all white birds, they don't show any other color, and now you breed pirates. Black tails, you breed with uh, blue bars, you know, white flights, and that's out of white birds. Mm. So it's not to say a white bird is going to just breed white birds. Oh, okay. But an recessive white yes. should breed just white. Oh, okay, so the recessive color on a bird yes. is fixed. Is fixed. Although if you breed the recessive colors with each other, yes. Like an recessive black with a recessive yellow, and you breed the babies. Those babies will carry black. If it's a black bird, it will carry yellow. If okay. it's a yellow bird, it can also carry black. Okay, I'm lost. Um, I'm lost. Please find me. Like, okay, what's the difference between dominant white and recessive white? Oh. Honestly, I don't think I have a practical answer for that. My opinion maybe might be that. Um, I haven't even used those terms before. Probably interche interchangeable terms. Um, you never know, I don't, I'm not yeah, sure. Maybe, I can't with surety say, there you have to ask a genetic expert. Uh, I, I help myself with genetics, but I'm not really a genetic expert. I, I would say most probably dominant white is, is a family of birds that, if you mate them in the genes, they, their offspring is dominantly white. Oh, so now and then you'll breed, I mean now and then you'll breed the exceptional bird that might have a different color with a white. But, um, but as far as I understand, if you breed, pure white birds are very difficult to find. Oh, yes. uh, if you get them and they are a of white and they've been bred a couple of times to each other, then you stand a chance of only breeding white birds. Okay. Okay, yeah. While we're still on white, I've, I've heard people that, you also said it, I think, earlier on, that when you take grizzle to grizzle, mm -hmm. they tend to be more whiter. Yeah. So, is it true that people say that the more, it's, the more whiter they become, the more it takes away from performance in the air, when they're rolling in the air? say that's a fact, definitely not. Um, as I said previously as well, I don't think color, yeah. color has got anything to do with performance. Rolling is part of, separate part of the genes. Color is a, another part of the gene. Um, the true fact is, grizzles together, yes. they do tend to get lighter, oh. but also, if it's blue grizzle or red grizzle, oh. you can find that you put two red grizzles or a blue grizzle with a red grizzle and you'll breed a blue check. Mm. So, I think I'm answered. <laughs> so the other way is also possible, you know, it's, it's what is in the pigeon's genes for the production of the bird. Got it, got it, okay. There's a saying in the pigeon hobby that if you fly mixed families of birds, you get mixed results in the air. For example, some come in, they roll early, and some uh, fly different, and some kit differently. You get mixed results. What's your take <clears throat> by flying mixed families? That whole statement is true. Is it? Yeah, the whole statement is true. If you fly, for instance, if you get, uh, I can take a simple example. Yes. If you buy licorice all sorts, yes, and you take the packet of licorice all sorts, 
and even a box of Smarties, and you throw it in your hand. Yes. It's all different colors, they all look different. Okay, they also taste different. Oh, okay. Because of the flavorings. Yes. So, mixed, mixed breeds from different families yes. all over. If you just keep them mixed the whole time, yes. what are you going to have? Different flavors, different mixes the whole time. 100%. As soon as you start doing your selection, yes. out of those, the best to the best, you will soon see that you will be either breeding in a line to, towards a certain line or towards a certain family within that breed that you, in that pigeons that you started with. Then the similarity comes. Then eventually you end up with a packet of pure licorice. Oh, yes. It's not licorice all sorts, it's just called licorice. When you throw it in your hand, they're all black. Oh, okay. They're the same. The pigeons will start working the same flying the same, have the same temperament, much more similarity between the birds there. Oh, okay. Got it. So, um, it also influences consistency. Oh. Um, having licorice all sorts, different consistency. Birds will do good on Wednesday, or maybe Thursday or Saturday, nothing. Stuff like that, uh, they will develop young and make mistakes, and that will never go away. The young birds will always make mistakes no. because you kept them in that mixed form. Okay. As soon as you tend to select and get rid of those factors, when you select, then you start breeding more pure, okay? and the problems will start disappearing, and the result that you need and want will eventually stay. <laughs> Correct, correct. What's the worst piece of advice you ever got about rollers? And what's the best piece of advice you've ever got about rollers? Good and bad of breeding rollers that you've advice you've ever got from people. I've received uh, I've been in a lot of discussions where advice has been uh, discussed on birds. And um, let's say bad advice okay. is that um, you must fly. You must fly the birds in the afternoon because then they perform better. Oh, that's not good advice to any rubber breeder. Oh, um, reason being, if you're not very strict on the birds yes. and your feeding is not right and your measurement of the weather in the afternoon, especially this time of the year, oh. is wrong, then you can make a fatal mistake. Oh. You put the birds up, they up too long, it gets dark and they leave them, you have overflight. Exactly. Chances of having overflight in the afternoon is much greater than having it in the morning early with early flights. Having bad weather suddenly creep up on you, much less in the morning than in the afternoon. Oh. Okay. Some guys don't have a choice. He has to leave for work 5 o'clock in the morning, so he gets home at 4 o'clock, so he has to fly the birds in the afternoon. So, to tell a guy to only fly the birds in the afternoon, because then they perform mornings doesn't help, that's very bad advice. Other way around, my perception much better. I have made, had many birds lost on afternoon flights. That's why I stopped it many years ago. None of my birds will go up in the air after three o'clock in the afternoon. None. None at all. I fly birds winter, summer, as the sun comes up, my birds are up. That's how I train my birds. Um, good advice. Yes, good advice. Good advice. Many years ago, the best advice I got was I was visiting old man, Uncle Marnie Mendes. I was in Standard 5. He was today in grade 7. Yes, grade 7. Grade 7. I sat there by him at his lofts after school and he said to me, You must always remember one thing. If you live dirty, you are dirty. Oh, yeah, that's true. So, 
Your pigeons must have fresh water and fresh food every single day. Water, although you use feeder bowls, a lot of the guys use the feeder bowls. Oh, yes. Those years we had those big chicken feeder bowls. Even if you use feeder bowls, the water must be replaced fresh every day. So if you're not prepared to give your pigeons fresh food and water every day, they don't breed pigeons. Hmm. Interesting. Now that's the best advice I can give you to any pigeon breeder. And that's what I received when I was still very young. So clean hygiene, that means the lofts, the food, and the drinking water. Rule number one. Those three go together. Okay, uh, who are your three best flyers? I I take my hat off to any guy that flies in front. Um, I don't really have best guys that let's say I idol or, or favor. Um, I respect any guy that breeds pigeons and has healthy birds. The guy that flies in front, but more respect because it's really put in effort. I don't care whether he's got better birds or whatever. But to stay, fly in front and stay in front takes a lot of pressure. I've been there years ago. Um, I took the game up very serious. Um, to be a club champion five, six times in a row when the club members were 22 members, not like today, five or six and seven members. Oh, yes. It takes a lot of strain out of a person and training those birds. You have to be on the ball. So any guy that puts in the effort, I respect. Um, at the moment, I know the guys flying in front, Jock Kruger, flying very well birds. I can see the results. Yes. But even the guys behind him, oh, yes. they're putting in the effort. If you compete and you're there, and you're putting in the effort, you earn respect. Okay. Not just the front guys. Okay, is it true that when you feed your flying birds high protein feed, they become too strong in the air and can fly for three hours minimum in the air or go to or go too high to be unjudgeable because of the height. Uh, high protein, bean, peas, sorghum, wheat, and barley. Yeah, I won't elaborate on what's high protein and what is carbohydrates and what is uh, amino acids and stuff like that in the seeds. Okay. Um, to me, yes. It doesn't matter what you feed the birds. Flying time of pigeons depends on the amount of food you give them. I can give my birds sorghum as much as they want to eat. And they will also fly five, six hours. And they can also go out of sight and out of reach. And I can give them a good portion of maize and they'll do the same. Okay, oh, can I, can, I, can I stretch it a bit, that question? Can I stretch it a bit? Okay, I was taught that uh, if you give your, 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 let's say your flying birds, a certain type of feed, like one type of feed, if you give yeah. them sorghum only or you give them meal only, yeah. you are depriving them of other nutrients that are found in other seeds. So when they're in the air, they tend to underperform because of there's some nutrients that is not in those birds that are flying there. So they tend to give you uh, results that are... Not that what are, you'd expect. Exactly. Is that, oh, that's exactly true. That's exactly true. But then you're getting into what the different seeds do. Oh, okay. oh. So now, me... Personally, yes. I don't feed a specific seed. As I showed you, I feed a balanced diet to the birds. Got it. Now, in my feed, I've got carbohydrates. Yes. I've got protein. Yes. Okay. And I have 
uh, amino acids. Mm -hmm. Your corn and stuff like that does amino acids. All the seeds basically has amino acids. But the corn and stuff can be set over to gluten, which provides more energy. Oh. Provides more energy. Especially white sorghum. White sorghum gets set over into gluten much easier into the pigeon and oh. provides a lot of energy. Correct. The maize gives you carbohydrates. Yes. It gives you fast burning endurance. It gives you fast burning fuel. Yes. Maize is carbohydrates. Yes. Okay. Peas gives you protein. Oh. Protein is used for muscles. Oh. Muscle growth and muscle performance. Okay. The amino acids yes. is there to provide vitamins, muscle repair, etc. etc. Okay. Correct. Now if you give the pigeons just maize, yes. and none of the rest, you're flying your pigeons on carbohydrates. Yeah. If you understand it correctly, then you're giving them fuel. Carbohydrates is fast burning fuel. Okay. Oh. Give them fuel. So those pigeons will fly high. Definitely roll because they're rollers, okay? But you're not feeding and replenishing the muscles. Yes. Okay. Not feeding and replenishing the muscles. When you give protein with it, you're feeding and replenishing the muscles. Because muscles perform on protein. Got it. Okay. They can work with carbohydrates, but replenishing and repairing needs protein. Okay. So yes, it will definitely influence the performance of the bird, especially the rolling. Oh. You get guys, they fly Birmingham rollers. Yes. They will during, let's say it's four weeks to the competition. Yes. Two, three weeks of those four weeks, there will be protein in the mix. Oh. Then the last week, they will start cutting out the protein and they'll be putting more carbohydrates. Okay, and they will feed less. Oh, got it. You feed less, you make the bird more active. A lot of the families get more active when they're hungry. They're still fed. They are fed, but they're hungry. They get more active in the air. Okay. So, but also not all the families work the same. Exactly. What I feed might not work for you. But I personally feed my pigeons a balanced diet. No, I can't play around with food and stuff this this to my day tomorrow they don't have the time. So I feed them balanced. And the birds that don't work on the balanced diet don't work for me. Oh, Those are not the birds I'm gonna keep. So what I'm telling that's why I said I can possibly feed these birds anything. Oh yes. But at the right quantity I will still get good performance. Got it. So it, a lot to do with the quantity of food you give it. And from feed to fly. Is very important. Oh. I personally feed and fly 24 hours apart. I can go with that specific feed up to as much as 26 hours from feeding. If I go past the 26 hour mark, then I adopt my feeding. Certain percentage gets added more. Only slightly. Only slightly. You don't make drastic changes. That's also the explanation that will take a lot of time. Okay, can 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 you can can while we're still on feeding, can we stretch it a little bit, that question? And then I've heard people who live in hot areas say that they don't feed their birds corn. And corn you can feed your birds if you live in a cold environment because the birds do need it to carry extra fat to stay warm. But if you live in an area where it doesn't get freezing temperatures. They wouldn't recommend feeding corn because it takes too long to trim the fat off the birds. What's your take on that while we're still on feed? I haven't experienced that, to be honest. I, if I, I haven't played with that or experienced, uh, I mean, in winter or summer, uh, my pigeons get corn. I, I don't really see a difference in the, in the performance of the body weight. Again, again, as I say, it's the it's the volume of food you give the pigeon. That's the main factor. Uh, I don't think hot and cold areas, personally, is going to make a big difference on what you feed the birds. To be honest, if you want, if your bird's condition is down, lift yes. the feed. Oh, God. If it's over conditioned and turning fat, 
yeah. and put them on a diet. Oh God. That, that's, that's basically, and if it means changing seeds, then do it. You yeah. know, uh, I feed balanced diet food and I change the volumes that I feed. That's the only changes I make. Oh God. You see, so, so I'm not going to really say, oh yes, it's true or it's not, because I have a I haven't experienced any problems or have proven results. Oh, got it. If you're flying kid off youngsters reaches five months without them rolling properly and have sloppy rolls, do you carry on with training them or you, do you get rid of them? On my feeding and my method, I'll get rid of them. Is it? Yeah, I won't, wow. I won't keep one bird. Is it? If a bird doesn't show in five months that it does have something in him, I won't keep Okay, there are people that swear on hands that look like cocks. Or cocks that look like cocks. Would you say that you prefer this over this? Or a bird is just a bird for you? Or for flying. For breeding. For breeding. Yes, for breeding. When so, you're selecting for breeding, yeah, yeah, maybe you're taking a bed from stock, and then you see the body type is maybe lean, and then it's a cock. Oh, cause, oh, 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 okay, okay. Oh. You, you mean it's a smaller cock? Yes. It's not, it's or, not as prominent. Yes, or maybe it's a, if it's a hen, it's a very large hen. It's a larger hen. Exactly. Yes. Um, again, me personally, Yes. I won't breed with an inferior bird. Oh. So, if my preference, my preference is smaller ends, yes. smaller ends, and cocks that show power, a oh, certain yes. amount of power. I've seen that in your breeding, yes. and they, I've seen um, that. So that's my yeah. preference. The so majority of your cocks, they look big, yes. and then your heads look nice. exactly So I'm not, I, I'm not going to deviate from that. I, I don't say I'll never breed with a smaller cock or never breed with a larger hen, oh, but it, it won't be my preference. Is it true that sometimes Soldom rollers can be one of your best producers at times? Which rollers? Soldom rollers. Soldom? Soldom, yeah. Oh, uh, seldom rollers. Soldom it rollers, yes. only roll seldom. Yes. Um... Most probably, it, it can play a role on the on the distance rollers if you if you breed very deep birds. Oh. Um, because keeping in mind, uh, you don't want if you find eight and twelve second birds. Yes. You possibly don't want them to roll within the first two to three minutes that you've put them up. Oh, correct. Um, so they shouldn't be very active birds. Uh, the deeper the bird, the less active you most probably want it. Um, also, even if it's high enough, if a 14 second bird rolls three times, it might not go back to the kick the third time in time and it will lose your points. Um, so yeah, uh, I'll say that it depends on, on, on the depth of birds that you fly. Uh, I prefer birds that work. I want to see frequent rolls at this stage. Most probably later on when my birds get longer in the roll and deeper in the roll, I will also start selecting for birds that rather roll less active than uh, more active. If you define seldom, it means in a day. Oh, not, yes. not roll Tuesday and only Sunday. Uh, it must at least roll every time you fly it within the competition time that you're competing in is 15 minutes, at least within the first 10 to 12 minutes. You must see that pigeon rolling, otherwise you stand the risk of getting an hour. Oh, got it, got it. Is it a must to keep your kit, your flying kit, slightly hungry when you are flying to produce great results from your flying kit? Do you believe that you need to keep them slightly hungry for you to give them to give you good results in the air? Yeah, let's call hungry. Uh, slightly hungry. Yeah, let, on on the actual performance on the performance on some 
Sometimes I have seen it does make a vast difference. Oh, on, especially on active kits. Knowing and knows we want to fly an active kit. Uh, years ago, we used to fly with kickers. Oh, 12 yes. birds, 15 minutes. Oh. So 15 minutes is not a long time, but I want those 12 birds to, to run on an average of uh, three rolls at least per bird per minute. Oh, to be able to get a very nice the score. Then, if we flew them a bit hungry, yes. hungrier than normal, they seem to be more active 90% of the time. Also, in doing that, you might stand the risk of getting an early settle. Oh. If you go too extreme, and then you get a disqualification. Um, so it's a very fine line. You have to look at the term hungry and define it towards your birds that you are breeding. So, where do you draw the line? How much is the feed? To have them perform to the optimum and still stay in the air for the total duration so that you can score and complete the competition. So, it's a very fine line. But yes, I have experienced that it makes a difference. Um, my birds are always hungry. I can feed them at any time of the day they will eat. But they are fed. The reason why I keep them fed, but eager to eat, yes. is that I have discipline. When I call the birds, they must come. Uh, and I also, by doing that, I start restricting their flying time. If I feed these birds at lift, I won't have the time. I won't be able to stand there for three, four hours while they fly. I've got 40 to 45 minutes in the morning to fly a kit of birds. Then they must be down and put them away and I get ready and I can work. So my feeding determines that for me. Do you do color balancing when you are breeding your birds? Or you just breed anything together? Your color doesn't matter to me. Oh, color I breed factors, I breed grizzles, so it doesn't matter. Would you say peregree is everything for you when you're buying best from someone or it's not that important? Um, me personally, I don't add a lot of value to peregree. Um, I will make the statement, if I buy a family of birds from somebody, four pairs, and yeah. four pairs are already family of birds. Oh yes. Then I would like to require the pedigrees of the birds. Oh God. So then when I breed with their offspring and carry on or even when I match them the first time I can have an idea how they are bred and how closely they are related. Oh God. Then I would prefer to have a pedigree. If I select birds randomly, like I did now. Yes. Random birds. Pedigree means nothing to me. I breed those birds I see what I have bred and I select from there and continue with the breeding. Okay. People say that you shouldn't go more than three rounds with breeding a pair. How true is that? Because you're, you're training them if you go more than three rounds. Is it true? Again, personal preference. For my birds, uh, this year, yes. I've got six pairs. I'm breeding basically five rounds. Oh, yes. Uh, while I'm giving my birds enough food, enough nutrients to feed the babies and look after themselves, and they want to keep on breeding, oh. but remember, I'm not forcing them to lay the eggs. Oh, God. They are breeding out of their own. And you can go look at my nest now. The babies are this big. They're already on eggs. Oh. I didn't make that fast at all. Just tell them to do that. They are willing to do it. Pigeons are healthy. Healthy pigeons can breed. That's yes, true. every pigeon has got a certain extent of breeding. Now saying that if you breed more than five, three rounds a year, the pigeon is going to become infertile in seven years or infertile in five years because you're using too much of the bird. Oh, that got it. I don't think is true either. Oh, okay, got it. it's got nothing to do with that. Pigeons become infertile because they are either sick or it's a genetic problem or whatever. It's got nothing to do with how many eggs it lays. You know. Um, okay. Um.
Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we're missing two videos. <laughs>